Today's lesson is centripetal force, the force you need to make a turn. We're going to look at circular motion. Before we start, let's review what we've already learned about Newton's first law of motion. Last time we looked at circular motion. Here's Kaveh Musavi throwing the hammer at the Asia Games. This is an Olympic sport out of Scotland where you attach a great ready cannonball to a chain, swing it around in a circle lots and lots of times, and then get points for how far it goes when you let it go. If Musavi lets go of that enormous steel ball, when it's right here, right at the top of his path, which way will it fly? Pause, write down your hypothesis in pencil and plus play to check your work. As we said in class, if he lets go of that ball at the top of its path, that ball is going to keep going the way it is already going, backwards, straight into the screen over his right shoulder. That's what inertia is. Things keep doing what they're already doing when no outside force interferes. What force is pushing it outward? There is no force. You don't need to push it outward. It's already moving that way. Now that we've gotten that so sorted out, let's play Soak the Physics Teacher. Mr. Omomowo is going to demonstrate for us how you can turn a bucket of water upside down over your head like he is in this photo, but not get wet. There he goes, up, over, and down, and no splash in sight, until he lets go of the bucket. Let's see why this demo works when your bucket is moving in a circle, but not when you simply take a bucket of water and hold it over your head. Draw in the buckets for the positions all the way around Mr. Omomowo's circle. And let's take a look at inertia. We'll start with the water first. Down here at the bottom of the circle, when the teacher starts the demo, which way is the water moving? Draw it in. If it's, he lets go, which way will the water go? All right, it's going to the right. Now, our goal is to get over here. Over here is right and up. Does he need an outside force to move the bucket to the right? If not, what direction does he need an outside force for? Write it down. Well, we're moving right, we're heading there already, and up. Mr. Omomowo needs an outside force to move the bucket and the water up. All right, repeat. Repeat for every point on the circle. Draw the direction that the bucket's already moving. Draw the direction that the outside force needs to go to get it there. Over here, which way is the water moving? All the way. Hey, it's moving straight up. Now, to get to here, the bucket over here that's up and to the left. Which one do we need an outside force for? Which one don't we need an outside force for? Write it down. Up's taken care of. We're going that way already. We need an outside force to the left. Starting to see a pattern emerge. This water's moving this way. This bucket's moving this way. And we need an outside force moving that way. Right here at the top of the path, which way is the water moving? If Mr. Omomowo were to let go, which way would it fly? Whoa! It's moving left. He would fly that, sorry, the water would fly left. He wouldn't get wet. The person over here would get wet. Or the purple trash can would get wet. Down, ladies and gentlemen, is not the problem. Down is the solution to the problem. We want the bucket to move left. And down, if inertia moves it left and gravity moves it down, great. It will end up over here, where the bucket is too. Water in the bucket. That's a definition of dry, if I ever heard it. We have inertia moving the water in one direction and an outside force, in this case the tension in Mr. Omomowo's arm, keeping the water in the bucket. The only time this wouldn't work is when Mr. Omomowo lets go. There's no tension in his arm anymore. There's no outside force and the water moves with a tremendous splash in the direction it was already moving. But, but, but what if what if it's not moving fast enough? What if, what if he, he gets it all the way upside down and it's just not moving fast enough for the inertia to keep it going? Relax. Conservation of energy. MGH, that's height, that's above his head, equals one-half mv squared. He can't 
get it that high unless he's swinging the bucket quickly enough to have more than his height's worth of potential energy stored in kinetic energy. Try it yourself. If you swing the bucket slowly, it will swing back, it will swing forth. But you won't get it all the way over your head into the danger zone unless you are swinging it so fast that the inertia will be more than enough to carry it where it needs to go. So, conclusion, which direction do we need an outside force in? First, take account of inertia. See which direction the water is already going. You will have noticed that that direction is always tangent to the circle, tangent to the path along the arc. That's why we call your instantaneous velocity sometimes tangential velocity. And if you're speeding up or slowing down, it's not uniform circular motion, then we'll call that speeding up and slowing down tangential acceleration. Which direction is left? Which direction do you need an outside force to interfere to go? You need an outside force to bring you toward the center of the circle. Not necessarily toward your shoulder, but if you're rotating around your shoulder joint, your shoulder joint is going to be in the center of the circle. That is the force you need to successfully make it turn. That is your centripetal force, and that it makes the acceleration you need to turn your centripetal acceleration. Vocabulary word of the day, centripetal force. Centripetal force is Latin for center-seeking force. It's the force that keeps things moving in a circle. Specifically, it's the force that you need in order to turn. If you turn, you had a centripetal force to help you make that turn. If you didn't make the turn, if you skidded off the road, that means you didn't have enough centripetal force. Centripetal force depends on three things. Ask yourself, what makes a car difficult to handle when you're making a turn? Picture a scary, dangerous turn that you would not like to have to make a second time. Picture a scary, dangerous vehicle that you're not thrilled about having to drive. What are the factors? One factor is mass. Bigger, heavier cars are hard to handle. It's much harder to drive a U-Haul than it is to drive a Prius. Another factor is turning radius, whether you're making a tight turn or a much wider turn. The wider the turn, the bigger the turn, the easier it's going to be. So if mass goes up, you need more. If radius goes down, you need more. That looks like a numerator, that looks like a denominator. The last factor, of course, is your speed. It is much, much harder to make a turn when you are speeding. Everybody who's passed driver's ed and has gotten a driver's license know that you turn with your foot on the brakes. There we have it. Mass. Speed squared. Look at that squared. If you go twice as fast, it's not twice as hard to make the turn at 50 miles per hour as it is at 25 miles per hour. It's four times as hard. And there's the radius in the denominator. Notice that this is a vector and the direction is in toward the center of the circle. And because in words is seven letters, we use the r hat. r hat is an abbreviate for radially outwards. Negative r hat is an abbreviation for inwards. Don't worry about this. It's just the direction. This is the magnitude. How many newtons you need? This is the direction. Important facts to know about the centripetal force. The centripetal force is not a new force. It does not go on a free body diagram. It's a special type of net force. What do you mean a special type? Well, it's the type that goes toward the center of the arc as opposed to the x direction, horizontal, or the y direction, vertical, the two privileged directions we've worked with before. Centripetal force is a net force. It's delivered by one or more real actual forces. Your first step in the turning problem is to figure out which force or forces are the centripetal force. For instance, throwing the hammer, you can clearly see that the tension in the cable is delivering the centripetal force. That's the force that allows the ball to make the turn along with the athlete. Gravity. When you're going over a speed bump, the direction toward the center of the arc is straight down. That's the way gravity is going. Gravity is providing the centripetal force that it allows you to go over the speed bump and still stay on the road. The normal force. The normal force is a support force 
and you can see the walls of this washing machine are supporting the clothes as they spin and turn. If you leave the lid off the washing machine, you'll find the clothes scattered all along a very wet perimeter of the laundry room. They stay in because of support force from the walls. That means the normal force is the centripetal force. And what about friction? Well, you can see the friction here shaking up the clouds of dust as this car makes its turn at speed. Think about it. When do you have a really hard time making a turn even though you're driving a medium-sized car, you've got a nice wide turning radius, and you're not going too quickly? Well, you can't turn if you're hydroplaning on water or if you're skidding on snow and ice. No friction, no centripetal force, no turning. You go straight even though the uh, road turns and you end up skidding off the road. Now, let's talk about the F word. The F word is a dirty word. It is a bad word. Do not let me catch you saying the F word in my class. The F word, ladies and gentlemen, is centrifugal force. No bunny ears around force. Centrifugal force is a myth. A myth is defined as a story that is believed by the tellers that explains it's something they can see. What do we see? Well, we see something spinning. There it goes. It's flying outward. We Oh, there must be a force pushing it outward. I wonder what force is pushing it outward. Why is it moving that way anyway? Well, what do people say in their myth? They say, oh, there must be an outward force called the centrifugal force that's pushing it outward. Through similar logic, I see lightning outside. There must be a big man with a long beard and a six-pack um, and a history of sex crimes um, with his local police station who is sitting in the clouds making thunderbolts to smite people who don't sacrifice enough barbecue. Through a similar logic, the sun starts to come up again and the days get longer in the winter time. So right around the time um, we are butchering and setting down for the winter, I know there must be a god of the midwinter solstice, the Hog Father, who appreciates all the ham and bacon we have in this time of year, and through whose sacrifice, red blood on the white snow, we will ensure that the sun will come up again and we will have spring. Or if this is much too scary, perhaps we should lose the tusks and the sausages and the nose ring and transform the Hog Father, whom readers of Terry Pratchett's satire on the Discworld will recognize, into the slightly less creepy version of St. Nicholas or Santa, the God of Presents. I'm sorry, none of these things are real. It's a myth. You've made an observation. You guessed what you saw. You guessed wrong. Come on, people, we know what's actually going on. You need, you don't need a force to keep things moving in the direction they were already moving. That's what they do. Things don't spiral outward out of control. They move straight in whatever direction they were already moving in. What force is responsible for this? Silly. This is inertia. It's what happens when you have no force at all. Must it centrifugal force? There is no center fleeing force. Centrifugal, Latin for center fleeing, just like centripetal, Latin for center seeking. There's no force pushing you outward. You didn't need to be pushed. You were going that way anyway. But this centrifugal force, we really should be calling it centrifugal, not a force. Centrifugal, not a force, is the busha of the physics community. You will find it in textbooks for the past two to three hundred years. You will find it not just in physics textbooks, you will find it in economics textbooks, life science textbooks. Every three years or so, I get an email for a t or a text from some alumnus in a major university saying, Hey, Mrs. Eliezer, my professor just started talking about centrifugal force. Part of me is dying inside. It's ridiculous. Who said that inertia was a force? And what crazy loons over the centuries believed them and didn't stop to think about it? Do not use the F word in class. The minute you say, this is like centrifugal force, no bunny ears, stop. It's not centrifugal force. It's centrifugal, not a force. And if it's not a force, 
we shouldn't be talking about it like a force. Now, check the economics textbook. If it says centrifugal motion, that's different. Sure, things move outward. That's why I call it a centrifuge. It's there to separate the matter that you need in the lab from the liquid. Centrifugal force is a fictitious force. It is like Winnie the Pooh, who is a fictitious teddy bear. And like Washington's cherry tree is a fictitious tree. I cannot tell a lie. This story symbolizes the power of truth in America, but it didn't actually happen. If you see a fictitious force where no force actually exists, it's because you are in an accelerated frame of reference. Physics doesn't work if your frame of reference is speeding up, slowing down, or turning. You knew that already. What you didn't know is that your frame of reference was the problem. Change your frame of reference. Get a frame of reference that is an inertial frame of reference, where you're not speeding up, slowing down, or turning, and look for the real force instead. Physics doesn't appear to be working in a vehicle or a reference frame that's not moving at a constant velocity. The ground is generally a very good reference frame. It's not known for its turning capabilities, the ground. Make your free body diagram relative to the ground, and you will be able to see the real force pulling the motion inward, as opposed to a fictitious force which appears mistakenly to be pushing it outward. You don't need an outward force to push you off this curve. Inertia will take you right up there. You need a centripetal force to pull you back in again, like your seatbelt, which by the way does not work on your stomach, which is why it feels like your stomach is flying, not outward, but in a straight line, exactly in the direction you are going, while the centripetal force keeps you on the track the way it should. Now, for a physics class, slightly modified to-do list. Make a free body diagram. Now, identify the direction towards the center of the arc or the circle. When in doubt, draw it out. If the problem came with a picture, doodle this right on the picture. If the problem did not come with a picture, draw yourself a picture. Then remake your free body diagram. Now, this shouldn't be hard. You found the right direction toward the center of the circle. See which force has pointed that direction. If there's more than one force, tally them up with plus signs. Now, See if any forces are pointing in the wrong direction, like anti-parallel, like away from the center, and subtract them from the tally. If the centripetal force is pointing down, and gravity has 10 newtons of weight, and the normal force has 8 newtons going up, then the net force going down, the net force, the centripetal force, is 2 newtons down. It's a net force. It's not any one single vector. Once you've found the net force, 2 newtons or anything else, set it equal to mv squared over r, and solve. If you're trying to find v in a circle, and you're driving in a car, life is good. You have a speedometer, read the speedometer, you'll get your velocity. However, if you have to find it yourself, then a quick review of circular geometry may be of a help. The circumference in meters of a full cycle is 2 pi r. What if you're turning right or turning left? and you're not going a full cycle, you're only going a quarter of a cycle. We don't say 90 degrees. We say pi over 2 radians. Pi over 2 is 1 fourth of 2 pi. It's a quarter of the circle. Take your angle in radians, multiply it by r, and you will have the tidy little number of meters you've gone in your turn, the fraction of the arc. Velocity is meters per second. How many seconds? Well, 2 pi r over whatever time it took you to make that turn. This will be a useful formula for average velocity, only coming true if you're not actually changing your speed. If you're not going the full circle again, take your meters, divide by the time, and you'll find your average velocity on the turn. Ooh, theta over t, that's radians per second. We're going to call that radians per second omega. It will be our official unit of angular velocity in radians per second. That's got to be one of the most obnoxious units we've ever had. Let's translate that. 
The seconds, that capital T there, is the time period for one full cycle, as you saw it in our first line. You make one circumference in T seconds. T is measured in seconds per cycle. So there's your linear velocity in meters per second. There's your conversion factor. And there is your centripetal force using the linear velocity in meters per second. Again, a review of linear and angular quantities. Average velocity, 2 pi r divided by the time period, also known as omega r, angular velocity in radians per second, times r in meters per radian. T, the time period, this is measured on the clock or on the gyroscope on your cell phone in seconds per cycle. Stare at the clock and see how many seconds it takes to make a cycle. If you find this somewhat difficult, Try going for the reciprocal, cycles per second. Watch for a second and see how many times it cycles. Better still, watch for 10 seconds and divide by 10 to get cycles per second. Once you have the frequency measured in hertz, aka cycles per second, take the reciprocal. The reciprocal of per second, one over second, is seconds over one. If you know the frequency, one quick button on your calculator, you will know the period in seconds per cycle. Rotational speed is usually measured in the real world in revolutions per minute, RPM, on the dashboard of your car or of your bike. The problem with this is it's not standard metric units. So your first step is to get rid of those minutes because they're 60 seconds in a minute. Your next step, once you have revolutions per second, aka cycles per second, aha, there's your frequency, is to note that one revolution is 2 pi radians, and every time you go around in that circle, that's 2 pi. I've put this formula up here based on the number of people who use it in lab. Measure cycles per second. Multiply by 2 pi. You will have the angular velocity, or the rotational velocity. Multiply that by r, the radius, and you will have your meters per second. Multiply by that 2 pi, you will get your rotational speed in radians per second as for the standard equations that you need. Now, let's practice. You swing a charm 16 times in 4 seconds. How many cycles per second? Pause. Do it in your head. Do it in calculator if you have to. Press play to check the work. Ready? 16 times in 4 seconds is 4 cycles per second. That's the frequency. That's 4 hertz. Now, the follow-up question, the one that tends to be more useful in this unit, you swing that charm 16 times in 4 seconds, now what's the period in seconds per cycle? Ready? Reciprocal, that wasn't so bad. 0.25 seconds, a quarter of a second. Now, rotational velocity, anyone? Rotational velocity, okay. Two pi radians in one revolution. Typed it in. Ready? Rotational velocity is 2 pi times the frequency. If we had a frequency of 4, this is going to be 8 pi. 8 pi is a little more than 25 radians per second. What if we want to live in the real world? What about revolutions per minute? Well, about 25 revolutions per second should give you more than 1,500 revolutions per minute.